day by day, is the shizzle. What it do, what it is, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to the Day by Day podcast for your Day by Day broadcast. I am your host, Day Day, and today we have a great episode featuring a fellow podcaster, and not just any old podcaster. We have a podcaster of all things Black and mental health live from Phoenix, Arizona. We have Kiana in the building, who is a mental health advocate, a human rights activist, and the host of Dark Sugar Podcast, which can be found on IG and Spotify. Kiana, what it do? Hi, I'm so excited. Yeah, we finally made it happen. I feel like we tried to make this happen a few times, but we're finally yeah. here. Yeah, I mean, but that's how, yeah, that's how it goes. Like you do shows, you've been on a part of shows. I mean, it's, it's just what it is. Mm-hmm. I knew how it was you- going to come through there. I knew it was going to come together. Absolutely. Live from yep. Phoenix, Arizona, too, which is three hours behind over here on Eastern Standard Time, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. We were, th- we were throwing off by that all week. Like, I am so sorry. Yeah. And then as with my job, I'm constantly time zones, time zone. And then daylight savings is next week, which I never used to care about. But now I yeah. have to care. Yeah. So, and, that's where, and that's where it'd be a whole mess. Yeah. And we don't switch here. That's what throws me off. Really? Yeah. We don't change ever. Oh, so you have to get accustomed to us changing our times even again, even though we're already three hours ahead. Wow. Yeah, I do not envy you on that. Shout out to you for that. <clears throat> but <laughs> host of Dark Sugar Podcast, let's start in some shallow waters first before we get too deep. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, I love the name Dark Sugar Podcast. How do you come up with the name? Um, it started with me and a really close friend of mine who started as a co-host of the show. And I remember just writing a list of names, like a combination of things. And I think I showed it to her and I was like, which one sounds the best? And she was like, Dark Sugar. And I was like, Dark Sugar Podcast done. Nice. It reminds me, this is completely random and weird, but it reminds me of um, spaghetti because I make my spaghetti with dark brown sugar. And that's why, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Try it. Listen, don't The not- sauce? Mm-hmm. And the sauce. And the- I'm giving out free game right now to the listeners. I shouldn't have even said that because I don't even tell nobody that. But yeah, I'm gonna try that. That's interesting. Just, just a sprinkle. It got to be dark. It can't be regular or light. It has to okay. be dark. That's it the is secret. a di- it is a difference. Yeah, no, it's yeah. different. That's the secret. Um, <laughs> how how long have you been podcasting? I know you mentioned you had a fellow uh podcast host, so I'm it's you know I, I take been... it you went through levels. Yeah, no, for sure. She, you know, she was a huge influence of the show and you know life happens and she's on to many different ventures right now but um it's been three years wow which is so great wait is it <gasps> wait is it four hold on it might be <laughs> listen 2019 2020 and 2021 okay, no, no. have flu okay. three it's three it's been three okay i need to double check to be really honest but i'm pretty sure it's three <laughs> Yeah. Like, like I said, I mean, these past two years, like, God damn, mm-hmm. they've been moving. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask you something. Mm-hmm. Um, you consider yourself a podcast of all things black and mental health, right? Yeah. Um, This is something that I kind of I take journeys, long story short. And uh, one of my recent journeys, I kind of came to a realization that um. All black people are a product of generational trauma, whether we realize it or not. And, Mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, most of us, you know, are ignorant to the fact that this is it. And it's set up to be that way. It's set up for us to not know this. Right. Yeah. Um, So you being a podcast of all things black and mental health, talk about uh, talk about just how important that is exactly. You know, and what brought you to both educating yourself and others on the important topics? Yeah, it's, it's a really, I just think I'm always talking about this in interviews, the power of social media and, you know, mental health wise, there are a lot of mental health platforms that have been exchanging generational trauma and the words been thrown around. 
Um, but for me personally, I think it's when my mom and I kind of came to a point in our lives and it was like the height. It was, and some people call it like the trauma point where like everything comes to a point and you realize, okay, in order to go to this next level, I need to let some things go. And on my next level was having compassion for my mom. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that, I had to say, okay, her childhood was actually like really, really bad. I need to have some empathy towards that. Does it excuse X, Y, and Z? No. And I had to do this like gray area thing for trauma survivors. That's really hard for black people. That's really hard. It either is or it ain't. What's this middle you're talking about? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's really hard for us. So um, it's important because I think first it's important because we talk about Holocaust survivors and, you know, I have the utmost respect for any Holocaust survivor, anybody affiliated with the aftermath of the Holocaust and World War, World, World War II and things like that. Mm-hmm. But the same empathy is not given to Black people when we still have, if you compare the psychological research of PTSD, I mean, sorry, of Holocaust survivors and PTSD and their children testifying, this is what my parents act like. It's the memes that Black people throw around back and forth of this is how our childhood was. Mm. my mom didn't let me sleep over anybody's house my mom was paranoid because x y and z my mom didn't let me do this my mom didn't let me do it's the same thing and yet black people really don't have empathy when it comes to our trauma Mm. so okay so we take it to yeah i I, I mean to cut you off we take it to more so you know the social media route to kind of you know, bring us all together with it and somewhat make like a joke or mockery of it, but not really take the seriousness of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's even like, if I'm going to throw it back, I was thinking to this moment, even yesterday, to where I was in Colorado at this party, a bunch of white people. And this guy literally <laughs> at this party, I it was in, I think I was in college at the time, but this guy literally tried to do something and scare me and another black person Mm -hmm. with the stereotype that black people are scared of simple things or we get scared easily. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a stereotype, but there's Uh, simple things like simple things like what he was trying to do like a magic trick or something and like scare us and have us be like easily impressed. Mm -hmm. And that is a stereotype. (laughs) It is because I just thought to myself, we love some goddamn magic. But if you really think about it, if you take a really traumatized person or someone who hasn't been exposed to a lot or shelter due to whatever reason, and then expose them to something outside their element, they are going to be surprised. So why is that so funny? Why is that so shocking? Yes, it's a stereotype, but let's go a little further because there's some truth into that. Let's. Why don't Black people like to do these daredevil crazy things that white people do? Why don't people of color do those things? I don't think anybody else does it because they know better. Asians, Indians, nobody does the physical stuff, right? Why do people do it, though? You said, why do they? I don't know. They're bored. (laughs) When you haven't had generational trauma, layers of generational trauma, you are probably bored and need some excitement. We've had that layer of serotonin going up and down through our families for years and years and years. I don't need to do that. My mom's, my mom's family, they're a sharecropping family. We've been through enough trauma, enough bullshit. Jumping off of a whatever is not enticing for me. Also, walking and doing our daily life is traumatic enough. It's scary enough. So why do I need to feel that high? A lot of people of color get that every day trying to survive on the daily. Wow. Damn. So white people are some, so really they're, and I don't blame them. They're bored. Yeah. But ask somebody whose parents have been through a war in Europe, if they would go do something like that, probably not. I met some white people who live in the hood that act like I do. When they hear pops, they duck like I do. You wonder why they've been exposed to the same shit I've been exposed to. Most white people have not. Wow. So that's why, so, but we need to extend empathy to, as a society and to Mm -hmm. ourselves, to each other. Cause even, like I said, even these little memes and the little hee hee and ha ha, when it comes to connecting, I don't see people like really showing empathy for me. 
Mm. Mostly. It's rare. Or each other. I'm just looking like, what? Where's the empathy there? So that's it. The generational trauma is this whole, I think it's just amazing how we're even talking about it now. It's becoming such a bigger topic on social media, but it's important because we need to understand what it is, accept it, and that's the only way we can move forward. We all need to agree that there was trauma in the first place in order to, we, <laughs> like, we right. can't fucking move on. Yeah, you're on point. Agree what what happened and it, what it was. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, you're definitely on point. Wow, yeah, I yeah, I like how I'm thinking down here. You took it all like you was like, nah, nigga, we up here. You took it to a a whole other place that it needed to be. But see, yeah. and that's why you're here. That's why you do what you do. That's why you study what you study. That's why you talk and preach what you preach because me the average consumer i'm not even thinking that level it's all good yeah bro it's all good this is what i stress about every day (laughs) this is is why this is why you're here (laughs) oh yeah 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 i can keep going (laughs) yeah i know and we're going to let me ask you another question okay so so, um what are some of we kind of you know covered it in a way i guess but what are some of the more common ways that the black community tends to deal with trauma that tends to be more detrimental than beneficial, whether we realize it or not. I think I immediately thought of two ways. Lay it on us. One way. And I have done this too. And I'm not going to say, I don't want to say this in a shaming way. And it's only the reason why I'm so hyper aware of this is because I did not grow up doing this. My mom hated doing this and it's teasing roasting and making jokes of really intense things. And I have seen it on levels, but (laughs) I have had relate for, okay. So me and my, sorry, I'm have so many rush of thoughts right now. It was just me and my mom growing up, Mm -hmm. but we come from a really big family. So when I would go into my really big family, I felt very unsafe because I developed, I had already developed a very strong inner critic of my own, telling me all these things about myself. Then to go to a family who's just roasting everybody, rarely giving compliments, rarely asking how each other's doing, but saying, but commenting on their hair, their outfit, who they're sleeping with, who they think they're sleeping with, what, whose baby they're having or whatever to their face, that's not helpful. Mm. I'm trying if I my place in the world my purpose and that's that it's like this whole big connection but that's just so not helpful and I get it's a way where it's like I am saying what's happening but I'm making light it's funny yeah but then the problem is no one can tell me that it's not funny you can't make it it's like this block you can't make it you just said it but then we can't talk about it yeah and um, that's one coping me- mechanism we do. And I know it like makes us feel better and it makes things lighthearted and it's a trauma response because back in the day, we could we were not allowed to look sad. We were not allowed to be depressed. So I get it. If I'm going to talk about it, I better be smiling while I'm doing it. Like I mm. really do get it, but it is so not, it does not help. It just stays in this like loop. It's not helpful. And then yeah. just sweeping and, and, things. But- Oh, I'm no, sorry. Right. Before before you get to the second one, I just wanted to harp mm-hmm. on to um because I literally can remember I can remember back furthest to uh to when I was five years old and even back then like it, the furthest memory I can remember back to Jonan you know it, whether it went from Jonan or Rosen whatever it was called even the words of it changed that's how long it's been around yeah, that's like, how long what? it stayed around <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah Jonan oh so y'all never used Jonan nah. I- no, I mean maybe honestly, maybe they do call it. I'm I was you born in Coast. California. Yeah, you West Coast. Coast. Yeah, yeah, so maybe they do, but I yeah. I just call it roasting. I call it teasing. Yeah, teasing, roasting, Joan and frying, <laughs> uh, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's all the same language. But yeah, I can remember back that back to me being five years old, and that was like the thing. Like you better you you better be good at joining or roasting somebody. Like that was like you had to like we would practice it. Like we would you know practice jokes and whatnot to you know hit on somebody if they you know came across us with a certain type of shoes or a certain type of haircut. You know what I mean? And yeah, you know one side may think you're bringing light to it, and you know either the other party may laugh and Joan back. 
but you have no idea. Like you said, that's something, you know, in the subconscious who, like you said, who's to say they're not, you know, really like kind of fucked up about that certain situation. Right. Um, and honestly, people have done like I like I said, I have the Vegas inner critic. So it's like I don't need you. I've already told that to myself a hundred times mm-hmm. for the past three years. I don't yeah. need you. <laughs> yeah. And then tell me why when I decide to say something back, I'm like, okay, let me roast you too. Mm-hmm. I go too far. Mm-hmm. Oh, Are you yeah. fucking kidding me? Oh, Are yeah. you kidding me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's like you thought, okay, you just told the joke. I'm doing the same. Did you? How was that different? How was what you did different? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And oh, so, yeah. and it's and it's literally and and here's even one better for you. Yeah, I think you like I said, the black community. We definitely that's like a staple of us. Like not saying we invented it, but we probably did. Because even <laughs> think the back, you know, back in like the what was it? Probably like the '70s or '80s when they would say yo mama jokes, right? How the whole yo mama thing started. Remember yeah. how they had a whole show on MTV called Yo Mama? Yeah, they... we probably did do that. I need to do some research, but we probably yeah. did it because yeah. it's like I, oh, sorry. Like I said, it's a really good coping. It's really good. Like I don't blame us. It's a really good coping mechanism, but. It's it more so doesn't... detrimental to beneficial than we realize. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, stop you in tracks. What was the other one? Oh, oh, okay. Like, so sweeping things under the rug, Mm -hmm. which, and I, the meme that I can relate this to is when, and I see this in the Hispanic community, a lot of communities, but, you know, we have a a large Hispanic community here. So I see a lot of memes about it and I, we can relate in the black community, but it's like, after a fight, your parent brings you a plate of fruit or they're like, come eat without discussing it. And we think it's funny, but I'm like, that's traumatic as fuck. They just did, they just fucked you up and then didn't address it. Mm. okay good luck being a assertive communicative adult addressing issues when you grow up learning to not like congrats and i it's like we think it's funny but i'm like that's fucked up they should have talked to you along with the plate of fruit mm. not realizing that when we get their age and, we're going to turn around and do the same thing and not right. just that it's spectrum because that's all they know how to do a lot of what we see in these relationships is a lot of exchange. Oh, I did something wrong. Let me give you something. Oh, I did something wrong. Let me do something for you. And it's like, we also need to talk about it, but it's but like, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a, we, and it's just goes really big to really small issues to really large issues where it's like, okay, you shouldn't have slept that under the rug. That's something like, I remember <laughs> growing up and my mom and I have definitely gotten better about it. But like, I remember growing up, something crazy would like something would pop off. And then the next minute she would just come act like, and I would just be staring at her. Like, you know, you were there too, right? Like mm-hmm. you also saw what just happened. And I just be looking at her like, you're not going to address what just happened. Yeah. Like, hello, we need to talk about that. But it is easier to pretend it, it just happened. It, I mean, it just didn't happen. Mm-hmm. But those yeah. are the two big things that I think are so subconscious for us that I'm just like, oh my God. You know what just hit me? Hmm. Um, just just the whole idea of you saying how, you know, it would be, you know, a fight or a whooping and then boom, go to sleep and the next day come down, eat your cereal. I just thought of ATL. What happened at ATL? Um, you know, he Rashad and Ant, they get into a fight because, you know, Ant got caught, you know, trying to whatever. And that was it. The day ended. The next day, what did Rashad yeah. say? You know, we didn't really talk about, you know, fights or arguments. We would just settle it with a bowl of cereal the next day. Right. And that's really how it is in the black house household. I would get my ass whooped and go to sleep crying, mad as shit. Wake up. OK, whatever. Come eat your cereal. Kind of like brushing that to the side. Right. But again, like you said, our relationship is 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 brought down is it comes from passed down relationships generational trauma the thesis i'm a i'm a title the episode generational trauma because i mean yeah. everything everything has definitely been tying yeah, back to type. that mm-hmm. um so let me ask you so um off of those two responses that you laid out with us which are great ones which are ones that you know we oversee but yeah. th- that's you know that's the small things that build up in the subconscious that 
you know, create a big issue. What are some of the more healthy coping mechanisms to uh, dealing with dealing with, you know, trauma in the black community? Um, I think self-awareness is a really big step. And for the longest time, I would say like, you know, we need to communicate more. We sweep things on the rug. Why do we do that? Da, 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 we need to talk more. And then the more I develop self-awareness, I realize, wait, the first step is even recognizing your feelings because when an argument ends in a bowl of cereal or ends in a plate of fruit or ends in dinner, you grow up to learn how to kind of ignore your feelings or you don't learn how to completely process them. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, I would really see the difference between kids whose parents have clearly helped them emotionally regulate themselves and kids whose parents have told them to go to bed and really haven't spoken to them. The kid's really mad. They, their tantrum lasts way longer. They don't, I can never like really connect the dots with them as to what happened and connect their feelings. Like even as small ch- kids, I can see the effect and I'm like, ah, oh, damn. Okay. So I think the first step of self-awareness is, you know, recognizing how you feel and accepting how you feel. Because before you can tell anybody how you feel, you need to know, hey, I'm angry because X, Y, and Z. I think, you know, maybe maybe I don't know the solution, but this is how I feel because of whatever. I've had conversations where I try to address it to a person who's not aware of themselves. Like, okay, maybe they didn't address it, but I'm like, okay, let me let me just help them do the step. Okay, so I see that we just brushed down under the rug, and I re- and they're like, what do you mean? Oh, okay. So remember when you did that? And then I did, and there's now I'm trying to explain the whole situation because they're so, it's their pattern that they're so used to. They don't even know how to self-reflect and like think back. So then I'm like, oh, okay. So we have two problems here. Yeah. (laughs) So the first healthy step is like, hey, you're mad. One, that's okay too, because a lot of times there's shame. You're upset. You have no right to be upset. What are you upset about? You're depressed. You have no right to be depressed. You're too young to be depressed. Get it to get. So we're used. So there's a lot of layers of regulating your emotions that have been distorted through trauma for us. So the first step, recognizing your emotion, accepting your emotion, it's okay. And then action plan. What do I do? And that can either be something outside of your body. I need to talk to somebody. I need to journal about it. But it's also like an action step. Our emotions can't stay in our bodies. That's another like trauma, you know, um, symptom with black people. We have a lot of trauma stored in our body because Absolutely. we don't have a lot of resources or don't know how to let it out. Yeah. And, and ab- absolutely. Um, it's crazy how on point you are right now, Kiana. I like, I'm, I'm really amazed by this because, um, we don't know how to let it out. We weren't taught it. And that goes back yeah. again to the generational trauma. And I say that mm-hmm. because, like I said in the beginning of the show, I had a journey that really hit me with realizing all this. And honestly, um, and when I say journey, you're probably like, what the hell are you talking about journey? No, a, psych- really? a psychedelic journey. Like straight up. I'm, I'm, yeah, oh. Exa- oh. exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. We can really talk about that shit, Kiara. Like for real. Like, um, so I'll yeah. just be quick with it. So uh i like natural psychedelics like mushrooms that's only psychedelics i've tried i mean i've tried you know acid but that's not really my thing but um i like mushrooms like maybe once a year and i'll call them journeys because that's truly what it is it's a you know a third eye opening experience for me Uh, but i set i set myself up to be in that situation i have to make sure you know Uh things have good around me have been good around me for at least the past few months you know i'm mentally good that day and i have a music playlist that i listen to um yeah (laughs) and (laughs) it's it's crazy but i say that because you know um shrooms will make you emotional and i'm already not an emotional person so during my journey i'm emotional and i'm like why am i so emotional right now and i'm like okay because the shrooms they open your third eye so you have no choice to be completely vulnerable for the better I was never again. I was I'm, I'm one of many people who's listening, I guarantee who wasn't brought up probably in a very emotional household. But I realized right then and there what are products of generational trauma because my mom wasn't raised 
in a household where, you know, emotions were expressed and, you know, she was taught how to, you know, all, and her siblings taught how to, you know, express them and whatnot, because, you know, her brothers and sisters the same way. We're all loyal. We're all great people. But I did realize, you know, we could be better with expressing emotions. And I thought back. They didn't get it from their parents because their parents didn't get it from their parents. You know what I mean? My grandfather, he was raised, you know, by, um, you know, um, his mother or his aunt and uncle, you know, but he didn't have his father around to really show him as a man. Look, it's good to mm -hmm. express your emotions. Here's how you do it. Here's how you go about it. You know, same with my grandmother. And it kept going so on and so forth. And I thought even mm -hmm. further to shit that more than likely probably came from, you know, the deprogramming and reprogramming during slavery days, the whole Willie Lynch movement. Totally. Totally. You know what I mean? It was set mm -hmm. up for us to be separated in a family, first and foremost, to where there is yeah. no type of emotional connection. They separated the strong yeah. man from the women and children. Right. And it just kept getting passed down. And then, boom, it hit back. It hit back to me. and like, shit. OK, here, why? Here's why I am. So that yeah. was realizing that how you spoke on the self-awareness, because I realized it right then and there. It took me 26 years to do. But I mean, it happened. You know, yeah, what I mean? that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the action step um, that you spoke about, you know, taking action step. I was like, OK, boom, I need to start talking to people, because especially, you know, the past year, I would talk to someone every day who was my cousin. Well, we called ourselves cousin, my best friend, but he died a year ago. And I mean, mm -hmm. we talked every day, like mm -hmm. about anything that we was going through, we were like, we was both each other's big brothers in a sense, you know right. what I mean? Like, yo, like do it like this, da, 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 you know, vice yeah. versa. And mm -hmm. I didn't have that recently. I thought I'm thinking I'm good. I'm like, damn, like I really haven't even had that lady. So it's even worse. I'm thinking I'm all good, you know, but no, it's even worse. So let me take this step to talk to people. I, yeah. you know, got enrolled in therapy and whatnot. And then even right after the, you know, after the realization of this, I'm not even going to lie to you. I DM'd you that night of you Shut know up. of my journey i dm'd you that night i was like yo we gotta do this episode oh wild. and that's what brought us here wild that's yeah. crazy yeah what the hell oh my god i love that yeah Third eye shit. yeah that'll that connection's amazing it's beautiful yeah it's amazing yeah and it and it's great and that's why i like mushrooms because it really it brings out the best of where you're at at the moment. I thought I was good. Like I said, I have to make sure I'm good for the past few months. I'm like, I'm good. This just ready to be a groovy trip where I listen to music and kind of vibe right. out. Nah, nigga, for the past year, you have been cut off emotionally. Yeah, yeah, you're good. You know, you're moving on. You know, you got a new job. You moved out of the state. You're doing good. But emotionally, you have been stuck. You know what I mean? And you ain't even mm -hmm. realize it. So go ahead and yeah, let me open up this third eye the way you ain't think you about to you think it's ready to be sweet. I mean, it's going it's, it wasn't bad. It was good. But yeah, it brought out something that All I right. thought was like, yeah. again, I tried to sweep it under the rug. But again, when that third eye opened, it's like, nah, nigga, we unloading the motherfucking closet. You know what I mean? Right. 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 That is yeah. definitely what it feels like. That's so wild. Yeah. And that's my, you know, that's my thing. That's why I like going on those types of journeys. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't do them. Like, that's why I tell people, like, I don't do, you know, psychedelics for recreational use at all. I, I literally call them journeys and that's why. So yeah, I just had to tie that together and kind of, you know what I mean? Bring the, cool. um, the root of it all, which is generational trauma, but just speak on how we even got here. That makes <clears> us <throat> even better. Wow. That's yeah. so amazing. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. speaking of that, actually a perfect segue. <clears throat> like I said, I have a playlist during my journeys, right? I listen to a lot of uh, most artists that are, are gone. Bob Marley, Jimi Hendrix, The Beatles. Um, it's, 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 it's crazy. Like my playlist is wide, but I've really picked songs that I think is a message within a message. Um, mm -hmm. But speaking of that, one thing that I noticed during my. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what the hell this is. Yeah. My, bad, my computer just did something totally random. Sorry about that. Um, during, during this last journey, the same journey I just spoke on, one thing that I realized with a lot of the music in my playlist was that majority of the Black artists, and this relates from old school songs to even today, majority of Black artists speak on an escape, some form of escape, right? I mean, if you really think about it, it's, and I even told my mom that she brought up a song by the Commodores called Zoom which, I mean, I kind of listen to it, but I didn't really get to dissect the lyrics, but that speaks on it. I'm a huge Jimi Hendrix fan. Um, and one thing that I realized that his music towards 
uh, the end of his career, he died at 27. So like the music that he made in like the last year of his living, it was more songs about escaping. One of my favorite songs by him is Hear a Train Coming, which speaks on him, which speaks of him getting on a train and getting out of town and escape. Um, another song, my favorite song by him is about Hey Joe, which is about someone escaping, getting out of town. Um, from songs back then to even now, it's always some form of escape. If you truly listen to, you know, certain lyrics or certain songs, and this can come from poets as well. Poets speak of escaping, writers, um, artists, you know, black artists, black poets, black writers. Yeah. But this escape, um, I want to ask you, where do you think this come from? comes from and why do majority of us speak on or try the escape route? It's always some form of escaping, right? We may not even exactly say what we're escaping, but we always speak, you know, a lot of our songs and, you know, just writers will not speak of escaping. Where do you think that comes from and why majority of us try to escape? Yeah. Wow. That just like, oh my God. <laughs> I told you I had some shit for your ass. <laughs> I like how it's chill. That quite, okay. I'm going to throw it right back at you. Okay. Wait. Let's get it. Okay. Okay. So I immediately thought of my dad who is the biggest, to me, like, escape seeker ever. He really battled with mental illness, like, a majority of his life, and he was a drug addict, um, like, the early stage of his life, and then the later part of, like, the last couple of years, like, five to ten years. And he's in, like, a really good space now, um, but, you know, he's been homeless. I've been his caregiver the whole nine. He's overdosed and whatever. And looking at all his records, finally, this like last year, I noticed that he moved every two years, mm. the last 20 years. And I was like, oh, my God. But I kind of knew that like growing up, I kind of knew that because he would have a new apartment like pretty frequently. But when my dad became homeless, I was just kind of like, where were you, where are you going? And he would, he was always talking about moving somewhere, going somewhere. And I'm like, where, where are you trying to, what are you trying to do? What are you, where are you trying to go? What are you, where are you looking for? And he's like, I don't know, Kiki, I'm just trying to find, he called me Kiki. And he's like, I'm just trying to find myself. And I knew what he was talking about, but I kind of felt sad because I was like, oh my gosh, you're never going to find it. It's, it's, it's you. But I think trauma makes you want to escape. I've been to the lowest of lows where I wanted to escape completely. So I get it. And so for a lot of us, for a lot of our people, we're operating. A lot of us are functioning on the lowest of low. We're going to work. We're feeding our kids. We're sacrificing here and there, trying to make shit work. So when you can get a moment away from that, I get it. And so that's why crack was so big for us. It made, that's why it was extra fucked up why they brought it to us. Cause yeah, we're going to get it. Yeah. We're going to take it. Of course we're going to take it. We're struggling. It's the projects. It's, it's racism every day. Like, yeah, of course. So. And it was extremely cheap. Yeah. And so it's, you know, that's what, that's what we're trying to do is like a little taste of the American dream just for like a second. And a lot of it is because, um, a lot of it is because of like no hope. I realized, um, and it's very subconscious, but it's like, you got to believe that it's going to be better than that moment for those couple of hours for that, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's really deep, but I totally get it. The escapism, that's honestly one of my like dark traits. Escape, like I love, I love that. I used to daydream for like hours in class. <laughs> it's like, like not daydreaming was like my thing. And I'm yeah. like a really good daydreamer because yeah. I, I have my inner worlds wild. Be and it's because I had to like where else was I supposed where else was I supposed to go right you know yeah and it's yeah 
and, and and I like how you brought up um because I was speaking of you know escaping and then I like how you brought up you know the whole crack epidemic because um that just goes to show that uh with the escaping it's it's probably more so bad routes than good and most of those bad routes we think are good but you know at the end of the day they aren't you know right. let me let me escape from all this you know stress and shit let me drink let me you know mm-hmm. pop this pill let me smoke mm-hmm. whatever i'm smoking whatever it is mm-hmm. yeah it'll make me better mm-hmm. but that tends to be like the escape that builds up that ends up taking some of us out and i say that because again going back to the journey i thought about you know someone um Jimi Hendrix as well. When I was listening, I was listening yeah. to I was listening to Jimmy when it hit me, of course, like I was saying before, and I was just watching the documentary, you know, how we went out, uh, you know, on drugs and whatnot. And it was this this gave me chills. You just want to talk about chills. They were asking one of his friends that he grew up with, you know, about his death. And he was like, Man, you know, it was off a drug overdose. So he was saying how Jimmy, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna definitely tag the clip here if I can find it. He was saying how Jimmy. He was just strong. He was a strong dude, right? Like I can, you know, take on a lot of things. That's what I do. I overcome stuff. And he was saying he just, you know, he probably took that, whatever he did, whatever it was LSD, heroin, you know, he took that dosage and it was, it was, it was crazy. Wilder than he ever thought. And it was probably the greatest escape he's ever been in, but it was a dark side to it. It was a whole nother side to it. And he said, the friend was like, Jimmy was probably like, shit, I'm Jimmy. I could take a step in there and be good. Let me just, yeah, let me step to this side real quick, see what it's like. He stepped in that dark room, you know, which was the ultimate, ultimate escape, however long it lasted. But at the end of the day, that's the one that took him out. You know, um, a lot of people who like overdose on drugs, it may be from a relapse. They're like, nah, I'm good. But like, nah, I'll do one more. It'll, it'll be the last escape and it might even be the best one, but I'll do one more. And that could be the last one mm-hmm. that ends up taking them out. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah, I just wanted to speak on, you know, how that, you know, both sides, the good escape and the bad escape or just the right. escape that's in the middle. I just wanted to, mm-hmm. you know, speak on the bad one because that's the one that ends up taking us out. What we think is the greatest mm-hmm. escape. Oh, yeah, this is about to be the best one. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, all, all the artists who have, you know, overdosed on drugs. I mean, they're living from the outside and they're living the American dream. Like, shit, you're a music yeah. artist. You're making millions. Yeah. Us looking at it, man, you you have it all. Right. But that escape that they slide into when they do whatever they do, it ta- it usually takes them out. Because like, eh, just one more. Eh, just one more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This would be the best one. But that's the one that ends up taking them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy how you can hear it in their music. Absolutely. Um, you know, because I listen to a lot of artists like that as well, like Amy Winehouse, Mac Miller. Mm-hmm. I like love that, that's, that's That's what I was thinking of, Mac Miller. Yeah. And um, what's his name? Oh, he's Was the it, one that overdosed at the airport. Um. Oh shit, Juice, Juice World. Juice World. Yeah. Let me tell you, I could never listen to Homeboy's music. I could ne- I could not listen to his music. I, I don't think I've listened to one full. Maybe I'm lying. I think I've listened to one of his songs because I had a mm-hmm. feature in it. But when I would listen to that, especially his one "Lucid Dreams," his famous one, I could hear death in the mu- in the song. I had to turn it off. I was like, whoop. I could, they're very connected. They're very aware. They're very like, and they're me like Mac all the time. Like all the con- people talk about the conspiracy theories. And I'm like, ain't no theory. Homeboy was just aware. He knew what he mm-hmm. was doing. <laughs> and even crazier than that, with all these artists that you can hear the death in their music. Why is it that that tends to be their best music? Yeah. Eminem, his best music was when he was Slim Shady, was when he was you know, hooked on pills and whatnot. And he was, you know, probably close to that if he never would have stopped. That yeah. was his best music. Now, you know, no, it's like, eh, whatever. Like you were I saying with Juice World. I think it's the simple fact that we need to practice more of the healthier ways of getting to that point. I have been there, but let me tell you, it was a little harder than just like, or it was a little harder. Like it took a little more sit down patients control over my body and whatever I've seen people who don't who I think their vibe went up here and they're like yeah I don't do any drugs ever and I'm like what and it's just because 
they have that you have to practice enough doing it without and I think it's like maybe a resource thing but to, but I definitely agree it's it's yeah their strongest stuff best stuff it's usually when they're like really going through it yeah and and some artists may even feel like they can't perform at a certain level unless they're under the influence I was watching yeah. a uh, ODB documentary when he got out of prison he had to be you know uh drug free and he was just in the studio going through it like he was stressing because like yo I can't like he would say, like, I just used to be fucked up and go in there and just rip shit. But now I can't. Like, I, I just don't got it. I, I can't do it. And again, like I said, with Eminem. But, yeah, maybe we should, you know, uh, reprogram ourselves into accepting the better side of, you know, things, uh, consuming the better side of the consume, uh, of the um, creators. You know what I mean? Appreciating that more cleaner side, you know, but then again, I, I don't know, you know, where that even comes from to why we like consuming so much shit that is, you know, more so dark that creates a better picture for us. It's crazy. Mm. It's crazy. Um, yeah, a lot of layers. It is. It is. So for, for escaping, I mean, I feel like you kind of answered this, but is it better to escape or take it head on? Whatever it is that you're trying to escape. Take it head on because a lot of times we think in order to truly escape, we have to go around or get out of, but you must go through and you doing your journeys, you know that how hard it is to face a really dark emotion or dark feeling, or even for myself, like I experienced like a death of my personality or an ego death or whatever you want to, a spiritual awakening, wherever you want to call it, where it was just like me and my shadow straight up for like a week mm -hmm. in my room. And everybody magically was out of town. <laughs> and it was so hard to like really sit there and be like, oh my God, fuck, I'm not like this perfect person that I thought I was or that I like try to portray, you know, or that, that I can be like actually manipulative or this or that or whatever. Um, Sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you you pretty much, you know, you use your example as the answer. I said, you know, it's better yeah. to uh, escape or take your head at on. You were saying, look, I had I to like, head on. buckle I've down with the yeah, with the yeah. worst of myself. Not the, I had to buckle down with the worst of myself. Right. To, yeah. Go through it. Yeah. That's what you said. Because I really don't. I've seen people and not that I don't do it, but I've seen people who are really operating on that constant where they're constantly running from themselves. And you just get very manipulative. You start to project a lot. You start throwing shit on people that isn't theirs because you don't know how to deal with it anymore. And you want to run for yourself so bad that you become like a vomit machine. So I've seen that. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, no, like, OK, no. And I've been like very close to getting there where yeah. I was just so, you know, running for myself so bad you know, you can, you can, you can't run. <laughs> it's hard to run from yourself and be a nice person and be a decent person. You're going to start projecting. You're going to start like those emotions have to go somewhere. Um, yeah. But it, sound, it sounds hard like, hard. It, it, it sounds like taking a head on at the end of the day takes work, which is maybe why, yeah. you know, it's easier to go the escape route. Let me just escape. It's easier. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so it's so easy to do the easy thing in life, but that's what leads to, you know, no true results. That's what leads to staying complacent. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's tough to take a head on, which is why so many people try to escape. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's really hard. I'm not going to say it's easy. Like, I get why people don't do it. Yeah. I mean, but that's the whole point of this to point out that, you know, if it was so easy, everyone would have woke up. You know, everyone would have been born in the perfect Max. way. Yeah. Anything worth having is going to take some work to get to. So, yeah. you know, we got to take it head on, you know, with a full mm -hmm. head of steam and realizing that it's going to be an uphill journey. But once you get to right. the top of that motherfucking mountain. Right. <laughs> um, Question. Do you practice yoga at all? Have you practiced yoga? Yeah. I yoga. really like Pilates, but yoga's yoga is really good. I've done like Kundalini yoga my mom introduced me to that it's really intense which one is kundalini um it's like the energy breath work one ah. a lot of like <sighs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and like <laughs> intense breathing to get your energy yeah. and your um 
I guess it's your chi technically. If mm-hmm. I'm jumping, I'm gonna mix it, but I I don't know what they call it in the kundal. But you know, it's the energy flow. It really yeah. gets going, and that is what jump started my mom's healing journey about three years ago. That's what's up. Yeah. Now, just to go back to the Kundalini, I think that's what I went to uh, deep. I, I just started yoga recently. I did it like in college after football games, but that was more so for the physical. But, you know, I went to yoga and really realized now that it's it's mental and physical, but it's more so mental and spiritual. The physical yeah. is just a bonus that comes with it. Mm-hmm. But um, I went to a deep stretch session last night and it started with that breathing, but not just a regular breath. Like she emphasized, like, you know, let out like a toxic breath, like, ah, like it was like one of those, like, but it, I was like, oh shit, hold up. Like I, I was a little, kum- she would just threw a little Kundalini at you. Yeah. 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 I was like, oh shit. It actually, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I, you know, I like it as well. You know, I'm glad that you, you know, have experience with it because it's, it's definitely something good that, um, I mean, you have to be pride and ego free and vulnerable, you know, for the yeah. better, for the better of yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's what comes with it. It's not just stretching, you know, it's, it really does, you know, bring out a side that you haven't reached. Um, right. It's a great form of therapy and searching, you know what I'm saying, of uh, the mind and the body. Um, Mm -hmm. but when I went, um, one thing that happened, so as you know, like I said, I just started. And as you know, with therapy, it's a lot of releasing, relaxing and letting go. Um, me, I'm a, I'm the type of person, my mind is constantly moving, like constantly. Like I, like if I'm not busy, I'm going to be asleep somewhere. Literally, mm-hmm. Like I've always gotten in trouble for falling yeah. asleep in class from pre-K to even a couple schools in college. I'm not going to lie to you. But I, I, I keep myself moving by staying busy in my mind and physically. I'm always walking. I can't sit at a desk all day. I always got to be moving, walking around somewhere. I'm always thinking of, you know, the next year, two years, like plans, you know, the, ne- the whole week I have, you know, just constantly moving in my mind. So I went to the mm-hmm. therapy, uh, not therapy. I went to the yoga, which is an hour long session. And the yoga instructor was constantly preaching, relaxing and letting go. And I found myself at the end of the therapy that I only did that for a total of about uh, two to three minutes. The whole session, my whole physical and mental was completely relaxed and free for about three minutes. It was during one pose. And I kind of was frustrated because I'm like, damn, I came here to do that. I came here to be completely free and just walk out like I'm floating. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And and I talked to the yoga instructor uh, after, and she was like, you know, she, I told her I played football in college. She was like, you're a former athlete, right? I'm like, yeah. She was like, you have to practice plays. You have to work out to build up your conditioning, your physical. You have to practice every day, right? I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, that's it for mental. You know, for you to just start yoga, you're not going to come in here and boom, you're completely namaste like all the way through just completely right. relaxed and walking on butter yeah developing that mental relaxation and release takes practice like it takes mm-hmm. you know building up finding that pe- finding peace of mind is work long story short mm-hmm. it takes practice um yeah. so with that being said talk about how that can be misconceived but still nothing short of the truth how it takes work and practice to find peace of mind or to exercise your mental at the end of the day I think with, it's really interesting because our society is so weird. We do this thing where we're like individualistic with some things, but then with other things, we're like very like in the victim mindset. Um, and so for, sorry, can you repeat the question again? I was going to start a, a story and I got lost in it. <laughs> um, basically <laughs> just tell us about, um, you know, the misconception uh, that people don't realize. Just tell us about how it takes oh. work and practice to find peace of mind. Or to I don't exercise that mental. Right. And I think because I don't know why our society is sometimes when it comes to how we feel, we're very into the cause of whatever it was. So I'm mm-hmm. angry. You made me angry. So and I remember <laughs> this teacher and I actually saw her like two years ago but this was in fourth grade and I just love that I still I've seen her recently but I used to giggle so fucking bad when I was younger I just used to laugh all the time like I would get in trouble for laughing and humming but I would get in trouble for laughing and I remember one time I like 
busted out laughing and me and my it was just like awkward silence and I was busted out laughing and she came and she was like why are you laughing and I was like she made me laugh and she looked at me with like the meanest face but she was so serious and she was like no one can make you laugh you chose to laugh and it was mean but it like stuck with me oh shit because, I can imagine I can imagine because I was like oh shit she's kind of right and it goes into taking responsibility and learning that mental health takes work like yes so and so said this and that and whatever but what are you going to do about it because i already went through the phase where i confront the person who inflicted the trauma right not the Mm -hmm. best idea to fix it like don't do that but um like hey you know this is what you did to me i think you should fix it because it really hurt my feeling and they're like they don't even give a fuck. So then what do you do? Like, what do you do when your outside isn't changing and you're screaming like, oh my God, this is happening. So this should be changing to make me happy and it's not happening. So, uh, and you're just going through that cycle. Well, that's cool. But I realized, okay, you don't care. So now I'm left with a problem. So what do I, what do I do? I can't, And then also it's like the layer of like shit's not fair. And for trauma survivors, that's like really hard for us because like shit's already not fair. And then the double layer of life being not fair. It's like, oh my God, trauma is not fair. Then life's not fair. Oh, it's not fair. And it's like, yes, things are not fair. Yes, things happen to you and then you're left to deal with it. That sucks, but it's the truth. And a lot of people are stuck right there. I've seen people stuck right there. But this happened to me and it's not fair. Yes, it is not. Things are not moving on. What are you going to do about it? And so it's really saying, it's really going to that gray area and saying, maybe I have been a victim, but I do not have a victim mindset. I am a garden. What do I need to do to grow and do that? Whatever it is, whether it's time, pick yourself up, plant yourself somewhere else around different people. You need nutrients. You need yoga. You need journaling. You need whatever. Do that. You need some downtime in the winter to hibernate. Do that. I don't know if plants do that, but do that. Like whatever you need to do to flourish, that's your responsibility. And it's, I've been through that phase where I'm like, okay, but it's not fair though. And then I was like, okay, you could stay here for a really long time. Or you can accept that it's not fair. Because sometimes we want an ex- I wanted an explanation. I wanted some closure on it. Mm-hmm. It's not fair. I want some reasons. I want some somebody to tell me it's not fair. I want the person who did it to tell me it wasn't fair. I want. Then I was like, oh my god. Acceptance is just it wasn't fair. That's it. It just wasn't. I'm sorry, to myself and what whoever next. Um, you know. So I think the misconception is that your outer is going to make you happy and your outer is going to fix you without you doing any work or the fact that it's just simply not fair should make things happen. And it's really hard, but for me, that was my like first step of taking responsibility and being like, Oh my God, what do I need to do for myself? Cause I used to envy people that it was like a love, it was from pampering themselves to just like simple take care of themselves. But I used to look at them and be like, wow, they know exactly what they need to do for themselves. And they'd be unapologetic about it. And I realized, well, that's them being responsible for their mental health, Kiana. Like maybe you should do the same. And you'd look like them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? One word that really um, stuck with what you were just speaking on was how you were saying it's not fair, but taking or responsibility that reminds me of a um, video I saw with Will Smith and he was speaking on what separates um, you know the average from you know those climbing mountains you know uh, um, not not literally but what he said was how you know it's a lot of situations in life to where something isn't our fault like you said uh, it's not fair it's, it's not my fault it's not your fault that, you know, uh, an example he used, it's not your fault that you grew up without a father or your father wasn't in the picture, but it's your responsibility to seek everything that you need to seek in order to 
make you a better man for your children, uh, right. for your peers, for your family, right. or for whoever it may be. It's your responsibility. It may not be your fault, but it's your responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. And that's and that's really just to kind of you know really uh, really reiterate what you were saying. How um, we think the outside should fix. That's why we don't really take into consideration, you know, that it takes work for the mental to get done. Us really doing, you know, work in our in our minds because we're accustomed or we think it should be the outside that makes yeah. us feel better. And shit, I mean, that's probably at an all time high today with Instagram, right? It's all about <laughs> the materialistic shit that'll make you feel better. You know what yeah. I mean? Oh, they're going to see me living like this on the outside. So it's going to make me feel better instead of you. And that's that. Damn. Yo, we we unlock some shit. So that's literally how people are coping with certain things. They're trying to make their outside. They're trying to make it appear that their outside is good, which will make them feel yeah. better. But yeah. they're only doing that. They're only projecting that. And that might not yeah. even be the case. They're not working yeah. on the inside. Oh, shit. Yeah. A lot of narcissists do that. That's mm. like their key thing they cannot take accountability so they need to make everything on the outside make them happy but the thing is it's like it's never enough right that's why celebrities so and so killed themselves <gasps> oh my god but they were a millionaire they had this and they had everything it's like no that's the point yeah they don't have everything these yeah. things didn't feel fulfill them that's why they had so much of it mm. um you know but it's it's a it's a really yeah, and it's a really hard thing. And it, for me, it was just, and, and to flip that, I think I've seen, the meme that I've seen in terms of mental health is your trauma was not your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. Mm. And that's really hard because especially when you have trauma with your parents or with a caregiver where it's like, they were the parents, so they should have known better. Sometimes you hold that till you're an adult. And to the point where it's like, okay, yes, they are technically still a parent, but now you are an adult. So there's like, things are changing, things are switching up a little bit. Absolutely. So it's hard. But for me, it was just like, I was giving my abusers a little too much power. Just a little too much. I was just, they were the main character. I was shining the light on the side, mm. getting like hit by the curtain and yeah. like, whatever and i was just like oh okay this is getting this is getting dumb yeah when they could find somebody else to go do that let me take let me go to my own stage make my own story right because i had to realize this toxic relationship yes i'm being abused but i'm telling myself something to make me stay there's Mm. something happening here i'm getting something from this i'm filling a void here yes so and so is doing this to me but what am i doing about it Right. I had to like really go there and that's so hard for a lot of people It is to go that extra layer of going, they're doing this, but what are you doing? And it, and that's hard, especially when you're in the midst of the trauma. For me, I had to just really, it was like a multitude of things that really broke me away, but yeah, I'm huge on accountability. <laughs> yeah. I, listen, Kiana, I guarantee there's so many people listening that can relate to exactly what you just said i'm um, shit this whole episode i'm pretty sure it's people you know listen that can relate to the things me and you have both said which is again why we're here um yeah and so yeah you you on point and um speaking of that you know the listeners relating and whatnot um before we get up out of here i do want to do something called word of the day so um before we get out of here today's word of the day kiana what i want you to do is just give one word for the viewers or listeners out there who are, you know, either negligent or just hesitant towards seeking the proper uh, mental health treatment to better themselves and explain to us why you chose that word. I think the word is accountability, which has been a huge theme for me. Um, and the reason why I'm choosing that word is because I want to just take the shame away from it. Because it's just really hard to, like we said, confront those really dark traits or those shadow traits or those things about ourselves that, you know, we don't really want to accept. It's really, it feels better 
for somebody for it for the blame to be placed somewhere else but it's like you can place blame like cause and effect like so and so did this therefore this but that's all it does it doesn't do anything else blaming doesn't do any we so it's like part of it's like we think it does something it doesn't do anything accountability is feeding into yourself it's giving yourself power acknowledging yourself it's like how can it's almost like you're giving yourself a plate of fruit and ignoring what you're doing it's like no sit sit, sit for a second and talk to yourself because let me tell you being a teacher and having to tell a child look i understand that you did this this and this and this this and this you are in trouble but hey you're still a good person mm. and i'm not mad and we can keep going and let's do better it's like why don't we we need to talk to ourselves like that that was just accountability that wasn't scary i didn't hit him i didn't yell at him it didn't it didn't look honestly it made him feel better it didn't really look like it hurt all that much it hurts when we're adults and we don't we're not used to that mm -hmm. but a little kid doing that they get used to that so then when they need to take action steps for a flaw or a mistake or a shortcoming or whatever it's not as like it doesn't feel like rejection it doesn't feel like abandonment it doesn't feel like i'm not perfect therefore i'm unworthy no it's more soothing and there's a flow to it because when i do it with kids the next day let me tell you they don't remember shit they don't remember that that happened yesterday they don't remember and mm -hmm. i usually don't either and so a uh, taking accountability you know the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, it's going to be really hard. But for someone that has been practicing doing it, and it's not that I don't make mistakes, I just don't let them. It's that action step in that flow. I forgive myself real easy. Okay, what do I need to do then? Who do I need to talk to then? How can I fix this then? Absolutely. You're taking, you're taking accountability for your mistakes. Yeah. So I just really want to take the shame away. It doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be hateful towards you or anybody else, you know, yourself or anything like that. All right. That was great. First off, I love the word accountability. Um, some might say, you know, respond. Well, you said responsibility earlier, so it was a perfect segue to yeah, accountability. Yeah, yeah. That's just like a, you know, a step up from responsibility. It's more, more assertive. I like accountability more. I like that you chose that word and I for sure like the description because I mean, of course, the word of the day was towards the viewers and listeners, and I guarantee majority of them can relate. Um, this was on point, like for real. Like right. I know, I know for a fact, man. So many people got stuff from this that really will lead to them doing some, you know, uh, self realization of things. And that's the whole point of this episode. That's the whole point of you being a podcaster of all things, um, black and I'm sorry, black and mental health mm -hmm. there you go there we go yeah, too bad. <laughs> yeah. um listen kiana uh dark sugar podcast like i said you can find on ig and instagram it is literally spelt dark sugar podcast um many con many episodes a lot of content on ig for you guys to catch so make sure that you follow her on ig and f um follow and subscribe on spotify as well is it anywhere else as far as the actual podcast yeah, everywhere else. But my initial, my favorite is on Spotify, but iTunes, Apple, whatever, Amazon, Google, all of them. There you go. Go ahead and subscribe to Dark Sugar Podcast. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe uh, to Day by Day Podcast, which is, again, on everywhere, just like Kiana said, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whatever else podcast. I mean, it's, 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 it's blasted it's, on stations that I don't even yeah. know about. Yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um. So, yeah, again, uh, Kiana, I truly thank you for joining us today. This was a great episode. Yeah, totally. Me too. Absolutely. Your questions were crazy. I wasn't I, excited. I told you I had some shit. Yeah, I, you <laughs> I really, yeah, I really try to take pride into bringing out the best of what my guests have a passion for. I don't want to be, you know, straightforward. I mean, yeah, straightforward, but I don't want to be, you know, cut and dry. Nah, this is the creme de la creme of topics. Yeah, um, I know. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that you appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate all the viewers and listeners that tuned in again. Make sure that you subscribe to both Dark Sugar Podcast and Day by Day Podcast. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you stay safe, 
and stay blessed. Peace.